Chris Adina is a co-founder and chief marketing officer of Orbit Media, He's an, which is an award-winning 38-person web design company in Chicago. Uh, over the past 18 years, uh, he's provided digital marketing advice to over thousands of businesses. He speaks at a lot of large marketing conferences, writes for a lot of large blogs, and also hosts a little podcast. Uh, along with that, he's also on a lot of different lists. Uh, Forbes top 10 online marketing experts, top 50 marketing influencers, um, top 10 social media influ influencers, and a few more. Um, he's also a co-author of Content Chemistry, the Illustrated Handbook for Content Marketing. Um, so without further ado, please give a warm Dream Bank welcome to Andy. Thank you. Thank you, Jake. Thank you, American Family Insurance. And thanks, Madison. I love being here. It's so great. It's not far. I, every time I come into town, I sort of feel like I'm missing something. I'm definitely missing something that you guys are a part of. Uh, and it's just good to be here. So this is uh, 18 years, as he mentioned, as Jake mentioned, 18 years in planning websites, search optimization, and analytics, and about 10 years of experience doing content strategy, blogging, social media, email marketing, and that whole world of content. So all that time talking about content, this is really a presentation where I finally get to go back and talk about that first thing, that main thing that I did originally, which was since 2000 and 2001, planning websites, building websites, designing things that speak to audiences, that talk to visitors, and that get visitors to take action. This is all about getting visitors to take action. That's the point, that's the goal, that's everything that we're doing today. And, we're, and it's focused on content, on the content side of, of conversion. So here we go. And as I jump in, let me mute this one. This, I can hear the audio. As we jump in, I want to say that uh, I have lots of friends here, and it's good to see Jill and Krista and Sarah and Greg. Greg was down in... Chicago for a little while and we lost him, he came back here, but we still have this rivalry. When either Greg or I get to uh, inbox zero, which takes me like 10 hours to do. Anyone here have a clean inbox? It just doesn't exist. Sarah does. Whenever I get to inbox zero, I take a screenshot and text it to Greg. And last time I, and it's a, uh, if you've ever seen it in Gmail, it, there's like a little, like a, like a lawn chair and a sun. Like that's what it looks like. So this is me texting Greg that I'm at inbox zero, like ha ha, look what I did. And within minutes, he texts this back in actual chair, like on a beach in Cabo with the sun in the exact same position. Can you believe that? He was in Cabo at the time. I, I, I lost. Greg, you win. That is total victory. He actually texted right back with a photo of him in Cabo San Lucas. Like, so anyway, I'm, I'm going to get back at you, Greg, eventually. I'll, I'm working on that. Conversion. What's a conversion? What do the visitors do? Whatever the goal is, that's a conversion. Whatever you want your visitors to do, that action they take that turns them from a visitor into an X. They were a visitor, now they're a lead. They were a visitor, now they're a donor. They're a registrant, they're a subscriber, they're a, they're a job applicant, whatever they are. Well, you converted, we all converted or we wouldn't be here. That's what I mean by conversion. The visitor actually changes their status. They went from a, from a stranger into a lead. They went from a, pro, from, a, from a prospect to a suspect, right? And these are all different types of conversions. It doesn't matter what your goals are for your website. This session, it will be useful to you. And I want to start with this guy. That's Jacob Nielsen. Anyone ever heard of Jacob Nielsen? Yeah, quite a few, not bad. He is like the preeminent usability researcher, this Danish guy who has done all the studies that all of us learn from, and he's been doing this forever, like since the 90s. Analyzing interface design, what works, what doesn't work. And in 2004, he did a study of 25 sites and 69 users and a bunch of tasks to see if they were successful. And they were somewhat successful. And he decided to redo the research in 2016 by taking a bunch of websites, a bunch of visitors, and a bunch of tasks to see if they were successful. And he found that the, the general success rate for websites in 2004 was 66%. And that the general success rate for websites and visitors went up to 82% in 2016. Now, I'm going to confess first, before we do some analysis here, that I was actually doing this, as I said, back in 2004. And I found a picture of my desk. This actually was 2001. <laughs> that's, called, that's called a cordless phone. <laughs> Ever seen one? Yep. This was, that, is a pot, that is a stack of DVDs, of blank DVDs we used to make. That's how you connected to the internet. It was not built into the laptop. You had to buy a card that you slide into the side of your computer. That's my copy of JavaScript goodies. That is probably Napster or Netscape. And I have pictures. I found screenshots. That's the number five most popular website in 2001. Google had not yet won the battle to become the dominant search engine. It was Lycos, followed by Excite, 
followed by Microsoft.com was the third most popular website on the internet. Yahoo was number two. Who wants to guess what was the most popular website on the internet that year, 2001? Ask Jeeves. Wasn't Ask Jeeves. AOL.com. AOL. It was AOL.com. So the internet was pretty bad. It's gotten better. <laughs> Jacob Nielsen projects that on the rate that we're on, it's going to be good in the year 2030. So hang in there, guys. The internet is slowly getting better. <laughs> That's not the point. The point is, there's, it's not, it doesn't work often. It doesn't really work, and our visitors come to our sites and don't take action. Why not? Why not? Success where everything is easy is only 30% of the time. Success with, with difficulty is 23%. 15% of website visits just fail. <laughs> they don't take any, like, they wanted to do something, they didn't do it. Why didn't they do it? The answer is findability. There was information missing from your website. They didn't take action because there was something that wasn't there. They had an unanswered question. They had an unmet information need. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to walk through and, and, and help you guys get better conversion rates, which is like a set it and forget it thing. You know, all this marketing stuff, you kind of have to keep doing. The conversion stuff, usually if you fix it, it stays fixed. It's like a set it and forget it website improvement for which you'll have a durable improvement. So, and that's the game, right? It's traffic times the conversion rate that equals success. The number of visits times the percentage of visitors who attack, take action is demand, is registrants, is donors, is applicants, is leads. So SEO, search optimization, times CRO, conversion optimization, is those are the two main skill sets. These people are called dual threat marketers. They are brilliant. You just drop one into a business and demand increases. It's incredible. If you don't need these people, like they're worth so much money, they're very, very valuable to have on your team. These are such powerful skills. I'm only partly joking when I want my two-year-old to actually learn these things. There's Eli. If he's good at SEO and CRO, that kid's going to get rich. I don't care what industry he goes into because they just create demand. It's like they fill the top of the funnel and they maximize the percentage of people who come out the bottom. And he's well on his way. He's doing great. <laughs> he's going to be, he's already really good at this. So there's two kinds of visitors to websites, first of all. And this is really important to understand. it. And the day that I figured this out, it changed how I think about it all. There are people who want that product and service. They're transactional visitors. And there's people who just want information. They're like DIY. They just want to learn something. Right? They're not actually likely to take any, action, any, any monetary action at all. Research shows 80% of the key phrases that they search for and that we all search for, it's not them, it's us, right, are information-related key phrases. I call them question marks. Only 10% of all searches people do are the dollar sign-related key phrases. Those visitors have commercial intent. When you understand that there's two kinds of visitors and two kinds of key phrases, you quickly realize there's two kinds of pages on websites. There are the sales pages that talk about the product, the service, the program, and there's the content marketing content, which is the helpful, useful information, the mini version of Wikipedia, the little magazine that's next to your website. These rank for the information intent queries. These rank for the commercial intent queries. Every key phrase, go look at your browsing history. Every key phrase is either a question mark or a dollar sign. Once you realize this, you're doing key phrase research, you can just glance at a list and go question mark, question mark, dollar sign. You can tell immediately that person's got their wallet out. This person just wants some answers. Very different types of visitors. And sure, these visitors might take action and subscribe, hopefully. That'd be nice. But it's these people who fill the bottom of the funnel who are more likely to take action, the people who arrive with commercial intent. So the thing about content marketing is you kind of have to have all this other traffic, right, and attract these links and followers and subscribers if you want a brand with enough awareness to actually rank for the money phrase and generate, generate uh, intent. So. But my friend puts it this way, and a simple way to think of it is, you know, the website is the mousetrap, the content is the cheese. Today is about the mousetrap. The simple, content-driven, no programming or, or design required. The content-driven ways that you can improve your website just by adding answers. We're going to go from answers to action. So here's our framework for today. Our audience has questions. Our job is to answer those questions. And then we're going to support our answers with evidence. And then we'll give them clear, compelling, specific calls to action. Question, answer, evidence, action. This is the psychology of conversion. And this is why people take action, why we all, why all visitors take action on websites. And I kind of think of it like a vector geometry from high school, which sounds weird. This uh, it's sort of nerdy at first. But we our job is to make the motivation arrow bigger and stronger than the friction arrow. That's why this little guy makes it over here to the right. Our job is to get this little guy to go over here to the right. Two ways to do that. Increase their motivation or reduce the friction. So you're going to see things today that we're going to do that that affect both of those sides of the equation. 
we're, at first, we're going to do it by adding answers and by removing uncertainty. We're going to add answers and remove uncertainty. So I'll give you an example. Here's a B2C example. This works for all businesses. This works for all, it's just human psychology. But here's a B2C example. This is an urgency-driven visitor. My faucet's leaking. I care about time. <laughs> That's what I care about right now because my floor is wet. Right? How soon can you come fix it? If I don't see the answer to that question, I am one click away from a million other websites that might answer my question. So the point is there to answer that question, and the answer could say something like same day on time service. The evidence might be a testimonial, I'm so glad you came right away. And the call to action can be contextual and specific to their concern by saying schedule a visit within 24 hours or call us for emergency service. Right? Here's a bazillion dollar decision with 11 decision makers in a year long sales cycle. I'm buying a new marketing automation system, or a CRM, or an ERP, or pick your acronym. Does this system connect with my database? Pfft, deal breaker, I'm not going to buy it if it doesn't connect with my stuff. Yes, it integrates with the top 50 platforms. Evidence could be logos, or could be the testimonial again. Thanks for help connecting with my system. The action might, be, might reduce the threshold, lower the friction, just chat. You're not spending money yet. Just chat with an expert about integration. You can imagine, if I don't answer that question, nothing else will work. I did this once with, uh, it was like a workshop with uh, it was senior housing. That's an important question. Can I bring my dog? <laughs> if I can't bring Buster, I am not moving. I will not move into your senior housing community unless I can bring my dog. That might be a deal breaker. Important question in this person's decision making process, right? The job is empathy. We have to know their questions or they won't act. Yes, we're pet friendly. Evidence. My puppy Buster just loves his new friends. I can kind of feel it. I can tell. It's going to work. It's the evidence. And then discuss pet relocation with an associate. Non-medical home care is another one. Here the decision maker might be the adult child influencer, not, the, not the, the person themselves. Can you help mom with her meals? Yes, our caregivers prepare healthy meals. Janice cooked the salmon just perfectly. Mm, so good, I can almost smell it on the website. And then ask us how we prepare and plan healthy meals. So there are all kinds of different answers. Every audience has different answers. The key is to first know the answers of your audience. If you don't know that, how are you going to build a website that speaks to them directly? How are you going to build a website that emulates the sales conversation that they would have if they called someone up? You don't really have a chance. Now, my friend Justin Rondeau is a conversion optimization expert. The guy has literally done 3,000 A-B tests. He works for Digital Marketer. He's a pro. He was in Boston. He moved to Austin. I wish we had got him in Chicago. I, I, I miss this guy. And he makes it so simple. Optimization is about meeting their expectations. Page elements anticipate their questions, and the page design prioritizes those answers. Mind control, guiding them through a series of thoughts, answering their questions, supplying evidence. And Justin's right that pages have to answer the general questions. Who are you? What do I get? Is it valuable? Is my information safe? But the problem with Justin's advice here is that it's generic to every business, and all of your businesses are different. So you have to answer that call. I'm kidding. You have to, it's fine. You have to answer this question. What, are the, what does my audience need to know before they purchase? If you don't know that, you really don't have a shot at this. You won't be able to convert visitors. You've got no, no hope of maximizing your conversion rate, of getting those visitors to take action. And it's so specific to each audience. So I did this once with a, um, about a year ago. I was in a graduate school. They do early childhood education programs, like master's degrees for early childhood ed. And there's a bunch of admissions officers in the room and we're talking about web design, and they're, they're telling me what they want. I think it should have this, and I think it should have this. Everyone's got a strong opinion about websites. Of course, we're all critics because we all use websites all the time. And I stopped the meeting and asked him this question. What do people ask you before they apply? I could not write down the information fast enough. They told me exactly everything the website has to have. They gave me the roadmap. They told me how to build the website right then. What do people ask before they apply? That's it. That's the answer, right? Now I just have to prioritize these, supply evidence to support my answers, and give, give uh, calls to action. So you should know, what are the questions that people always ask before hiring us? This is Joel Kletke. He's in Calgary. He's not famous. Anyone heard of Joel Kletke? I'd be amazed. Yes, good for you. We're going to get him at our event in, uh, in, in uh, October. Joel was hired by HubSpot. Anyone heard of HubSpot? Everyone's heard of HubSpot. HubSpot had a problem on their landing pages, and they wanted to improve the conversion rate. They were wasting money on ads. How do they improve their conversion rate? Well, they called this guy. So they called Joel, they called Joel and Joel 
picks up the phone and says, sure, I'll help you. And what he did first, what he did, was he interviewed HubSpot customers and asked, what was happening that sent you looking for a solution? What did you try and what didn't you love about it? What almost kept you from buying HubSpot? What, gave, what made you confident enough to give it a try? What made this the best solution for you? When evaluating options, what was the most important thing? There's your prioritization, right? What can you do now or what can you do better that you couldn't do before? There's your testimonial seeking question, right? And give me an example of when this tool made a difference for you. This has basically now become my, my, the way that I talk to clients and the way that I gather information and the way that I then can prioritize the content on sales pages to maximize the percentage of people who take action. By the way, you're going to get these slides. You can take a picture now if you'd like. This is, uh, we're giving away a book. It's on page 54. Uh, or just give me a thumb drive at the end and we'll give it to you right here. Uh, or an email address and I'll send it to you tomorrow. So Joel's point is that writers, website writers, content planners, website planners make this mistake. They get stuck behind their screens and they start writing about crap that nobody cares about <laughs> instead of writing about the answer that that visitor came to seek, right? The problem with websites is you can't see people. You don't see 100 people walk in the door, turn the corner, look at the sign, and walk out because they didn't see what they were looking for because they're kind of invisible to us unless you are really good at analytics. If you had a store, if it was physically in a store and you saw everyone come in and walk right out because they looked, at the, you know, looked around and didn't find what they were looking for, you'd try to figure out what they needed. That's the problem with web design. So that's our job, basically, and Marcus Sheridan puts it very simply. I think he wrote a book called this. They ask, you answer. That's the job. In one word, what does the website have to do? Answer. <laughs> That's why it exists. That's why visitors came. That's why people are on your website. That's why you go to websites, is to find information, to find that answer. So now we're going to solve for X. We're going to solve for that problem that Jacob Nielsen identified as the flaw in websites, which is findability, missing information. Now, it's not just about adding the answer, but I think we all have an opportunity to upgrade that answer. To just write the answer as text on your website is certainly better than not having it. But anything that you put on a website, you've got two opportunities to improve it. One is to improve the format from text to something visual, or better yet, something visual with movement from text to images to video. And you've got the opportunity to not just keep saying it yourself over and over. Thanks. And, and let other people say it for you. Improve it, right? Have other people say it, or have the audience themselves say it. Here's some examples. Question. Are you fast? Can you get it to me on time? Answer, yeah, we're fast. But for you to say it as text, totally common, generic, expected, not compelling marketing copy. We are number one in on-time deliveries, fast service every time. That is the weakest way to say anything on the internet. And that's you saying it in your voice and you saying it as text. Far better would be to let the audience say it. Put it on the site as a testimonial. Let the customer say it in their voice because they're going to write copy that you could never even hope to write. They are way better at copy than you are. In fact, this was, this was, I didn't mention it, this was Joel's trick. All those interviews he did of all those HubSpot customers, he didn't just find out what was important to them and then go write it. He used their language on the HubSpot landing pages. I don't know if I mentioned this, the outcome. He doubled, that's the guy who doubled HubSpot's conversion rates. How many millions of dollars was that worth to HubSpot hiring Joel? In fact, we could stop now, just go hire Joel. <laughs> that guy's a genius. He's really good. So yeah, so the, video, so the client testimonial using their words, because you can't write copy that good, right? Or, or of course, you can just get third party endorsements, a third party endorsement, which is sometimes a trust seal, they call it, or a visual or a badge, something, you know, you put it on the bottom, of the, right above your foot or a bunch of these trust seals, improves it, uh, credibility. But the ultimate format and the ultimate uh, messenger is the customer themselves and doing it as video. The video testimonial is the most powerful piece of content you could ever add to a website because you get tone of voice, you get body language, it's them saying it themselves, right? Do whatever you can to get video testimonials on your site and just measure the conversion rate before and after. Just make sure to put them on your most popular pages. I had a client who did this. It's like, yeah, we added video testimonials, but uh, nothing happened. I'm like, really? Wow, show me, show me what, what went wrong here. Oh yeah, first you go to the case study section and case studies two and three each have a testimonial Click on number two, scroll down to the bottom, you see that link that takes you to a page with, like, what? <laughs> yeah, put billboards on highways. <laughs> like, that's a back street. Like, you know, just, if you make a super powerful piece of content, 
put it on your most popular page. Make it as visible as possible, right? Probably the top of the home page would be, put it wherever, you, you know, just look at analytics, the site content, all pages report will show you your most popular pages. Put your strongest content on your most popular pages, your best foot forward. So yeah, there's sort of a law of visual hierarchy. There's rules built into our minds. There's a cognitive bias. And the way the human eye works, the biology of the eye and the occipital lobe, the brain, it actually has, you can control people's eyes very easily, and it's part of the job of the designer. Here's a generic sort of way of thinking of it. Big stuff will get more attention than small stuff. Things high up will get more attention than things farther down. Things that have strong contrast and a unique color, a color that contrasts with the rest of the page around it, will be more visually prominent. We'll see an example in a minute. Also, movement is more powerful than text. Text is the weakest format. And just making space around things, just removing crap that no one's using on your page will make it a better page. Just taking stuff away, things surrounded by white space. So there's some general rules for how to make something visually prominent. So next we're going to add evidence. I'm going to focus on that. So we went from question to answer to evidence in our framework. And our goal here is to make the first arrow bigger and stronger, and make the second arrow smaller and weaker by adding support to, for our, our marketing claims. Anything that you say that doesn't have evidence, you just made an unsupported marketing claim. Go look at any of your pages and count the number of marketing claims you made, and then count the number of them that you, that you supported with evidence. Most websites are filled with unsupported marketing claims. It's just mostly what they are. They're just piles of stuff of people saying, number one on time, fast deliveries, blah, 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 never supporting anything that they say at all. Lots of pages have zero evidence whatsoever. So there's really two kinds of evidence, and this goes back to we're in a college town, that's Aristotle. The, uh, the three modes of persuasion, some people really geek out over this. Pathos, logos, and ethos, which is basically like emotion, reason, and, and ethics. Or the heart, the head, and credibility. Now, assuming that you have a good website and that it look, doesn't offend people who land there, let's just set credibility aside. This is just sort of like you know, what you're wearing or the general design. But the two kinds, so then there are two left. The two kinds of credibility we can add to sites are those that appeal to emotion or those that appeal to reason. Anyone here taking the DISC test or Myers-Briggs? You guys like these? Yeah. So you know that there's some, type, there's some people who like lots of information, and there's some people who are more quick decision makers. In fact, we all have all of these traits. But our audience, we don't know exactly who the audience is, and we can't tailor our websites to specific personality types. So it's useful to add both of these, which is totally familiar to anyone who's ever read a newspaper. Because there's, there's statistical, a big quantitative data, and then there's the stories, the qualitative data. The volcano exploded and 33,000 30, people were displaced from their homes, and Pedro was separated from his dog. Like, when did you start to care about this story? It was when, the, the, when it got personal, right? So I'm going to recommend adding both. Add data for people who like data, and add the, the small, the quantitative, the, the qualitative thing, the testimonial as well. So yeah, it could be percent increase, dollars saved, years in business, happy customers, best sellers, right? star reviews. Look at an Amazon page. Star reviews are, are uh, quantitative. But then the, test, the, the review itself, the case study, the testimonials, these are the, the small data, so you can use both. Justin agrees. Rob Biesenbach agrees. Most conversion optimization pros agree that it's the story that is better at connecting with humans, that the buy button in your audience's brain is much more emotional we are, we are uh, very poor cost-benefit calculators, and we are very prone to emotional appeal. Uh, we are not thinking machines that feel. We are feeling machines that think sometimes. We don't always think, but we definitely always feel. So, so the idea is that, that the you know, facts are cold and hard. That's, that's the uh, quantitative. They don't have the ability to warm hearts, which is what Rob would tell us to do in his book about storytelling. But you've got an unlimited number of pixels on this page. You're never going to run out of space. Right? That's the magic of digital. TV and radio, you buy an X amount of time. Print, newspaper, magazine, you buy X amount of space. But this is the web. You take as much time and space as you want. <laughs> There's no limit. So go ahead and build a page that's got both. Here's a page on our site about web design. 41%. That's the average increase in conversion rates for websites we build. Over the last 20 websites, whenever I did that analysis. Further down the page, here's Jim Stein saying, Without question, choosing Orbit was the best decision I've made in business for 25 years. I could never write copy that good. I just can't write copy that good. <laughs> it's impossible. Marketers, everything that you write is automatically marketing. Automatic, you just can't get out of that, right? But when they say it, it's social proof. So these are um, 
It's very powerful to add, and there's no limit to the number you can add. Here's my trick for uh, seven things to add to every testimonial. There's a good reason why Amazon makes you write a little headline above each review. And it's to make the most compelling part of that review more visually prominent. It stands out, right? Again, text, it's kind of weak. It's just a chunk of text. But that little headline above it, so whenever you get a testimonial, take the best five words out of the testimonial and make it the headline. A greater percentage of your visitors will see it as they scroll down the page. You're, they're not readers, they're scanners. All of our visitors are scanning. And then, of course, make the person credible. You know, add the logo, add the picture, add the name, add the title, add the company. But the other trick, and I'm going to combine SEO and CRO here, the key phrased focused testimonial is one of only four tricks I know of in all of digital that can increase both traffic and the conversion rate at the same time. The key phrase helps you rank higher for the phrase. The testimonial adds evidence and improves trust and credibility, improving the conversion rate. Almost every page on the, uh, every one of your sales pages could be improved by just a stack of three or four key phrase focused testimonials down at the bottom of the page. There's no, I can't imagine how that could be, ever be a bad idea. Right? Indicate relevance and build trust. So speaking of how many, I know that um, we did this for years. By the way, I have two former project managers here who combined managed probably two or 300 projects between you guys. Krista and Jill are experts at website planning. Ask them anything. We worked together for a long time. I was very honored by that. And you probably heard me say this so many times. I would say, let's put a testimonial on every page. I've changed that thinking. I don't think we should put a single testimonial on every page. I'm starting to think that that's kind of the main thing that pages should have and that there's really no limit to the number of testimonials you'd have on a page, right? Does Amazon say, oh, you've got enough reviews now, stop adding reviews? I couldn't believe this. So I'm looking for a show with my wife. She wants to watch uh, Man in the High Castle. It's an Amazon show. How many reviews does season one have? 110,000 reviews. Not even kidding. Who writes the 110,000th review? Doesn't, doesn't the audience? <laughs> Doesn't the audience someday say, oh, they're, they're good on that? <laughs> Why would you keep it? But, but, the, but the point is, there's like no limit to the amount of trust you should be building, right? You want to be credible as a person. You don't say, oh, there's enough people who like me. Don't be my friend. <laughs> you would never do that, right? More, more is always better, I guess, in this category of trust and reviews and testimonials and social proof. So yeah, so these are tall pages. They don't stop. And they don't paginate. And they don't use tabs. Why don't they use tabs? Because 100% of your visitors and their visitors, their fingers on a piece of glass or a trackpad or a scroll wheel. Years ago, we used to say, oh, we made a carousel so people can see the next slide if they click here. No, no, you just hid the next slide. Oh, we made tabs so people can see that other information if they click here. No, no, you hid that information. Modern web design is about stacking this stuff up in a super tall page because 100% of your, your visitors are just going to scroll. Uh, and a lot of them will scroll pretty far down the page. But my point here is about the amount of tr trust on the page. Look at that. 3,100 pixels of this. Yes, I am that nerdy. I actually got it like, like used Photoshop to measure. That is 44% of this Amazon page's evidence. What percentage of your pages are evidence? I'm going to break down a page that's even more fun, more interesting. This is Ali Gardner, who's the co-founder of Unbounce. Unbounce is a conversion optimization company. It's a platform for designing and measuring and optimizing landing pages. Ali has done, Ali's written 400 articles about conversion. <laughs> the guy is like lives this. That's all he does. So I'm going to break down Ali's page. This is the top of it. This is his speaker's page. What's the top of the visual hierarchy here? His face. Faces are unbelievably powerful magnets for attention. You look at Ali first because he's a human. But what is Ali looking at? You know this trick? Yeah. You look where they look. Ali hates the example of the baby, but it's so easy to use. Baby looks at the camera, you look at the baby. Baby looks at the headline, you look at the headline. You look where they look. There's an invisible arrow shooting out of the eyes of every image and every website you've seen, and it, it's a magnet for your attention, literally line of sight. This is the top converting landing page that Lead Pages has ever tested, another landing page authoring company. Fluid Surveys knows this. Chemistry.com knows this. So you, you can use that trick. Here's a test that CXL did. Lawyer looks away from the form. Lawyer looks at the form. Little hand-drawn arrow toward the form. Which of these gets, uh, gets the visitors to look at the form? Number one? Zero people say that. I just said that was bad. Good, good answer. <laughs> no, <laughs> number two? Number two. 
gets a lot of people look at the form more, for more seconds. Than the, or how about number three, the hand-drawn arrow? Two of you said the hand-drawn arrow. You are correct. How gullible are we? If you want someone to look at something, just point an arrow to it. How weird is that? <laughs> it works really well. The little hand-drawn arrow actually is killing it. Like uh, People just look at stuff that you point to. I don't, I mean, I shouldn't say them. Again, we all look at things that someone's pointing to. It's crazy how predictable we are as humans. Yeah, the arrow gets people to look at the form more than the other two examples. It's even more powerful than the face. Down the visual hierarchy. Okay, so you look at Ali. Ali's looking at the, the headline, which says what? Book, it starts with a verb, which I love. I pay so much attention to verbs. I'm all about verb. People are like, Andy, will you look at this page for me? Sure. I'm actually counting and looking carefully. How strong are those verbs? How specific are those verbs? Book Ali for your next marketing event. Very obvious why we're all here, right? If you don't want that, you're in the wrong place. But the next thing in the visual hierarchy is what? The big button. Why? The color. The color, right? It's orange on a blue background. Remember this from art school? The, the warm colors are red, orange, and yellow. The cool colors are green, purple, and blue. In a cool context, a warm color will stand out. That's called contrast. The human eye just gets way too much information to pay attention to everything. So it's literally trying to save energy by just paying attention to those things that interrupt the pattern around it. That's why movement works. That's why white space works. That's why the laws of visual hierarchy are what they are. So color works really well. So websites tend to be cool colored backgrounds, a lot of brands, right? So choose one color to be the action color. Try this, right? Most people don't do that. Choose one color to be the action color on your website and just always use that color as the action. It's not the only way to do it. There's lots of ways to do it. Ask your designer. But generally, yeah, Ali's got that. He deliberately did that. He's got an orange button on a, on a blue background. Lots of websites do this very poorly, and I have strong opinions about this. Anyone whose website has big social media icons in the header, I think that's a crazy idea. I think it's horrible web design. This is a cool, you know, light colored design. And then there's, so obviously at the top of the visual hierarchy are these big red candy colored buttons up here, which do what? Which take you away from the site, right? Why would you send people away from your site? If I designed a, a store for you, oh, come on, you gotta check it out. I finally finished building your store. And you walked in and there's a giant exit sign right inside the front door. You'd fire me, because I'm obviously a bad architect. But people live with websites that do this all the time. What a horrible way to, visitors are hard, tra where there's traffic, there's hope. Visitors are hard to win and easy to lose. They're never coming back. These companies spend millions of dollars to, to, on usability studies to keep those people on those pages, right? The click-through rate from YouTube to company websites is like 0.07%. Like they are very, very good at keeping their visitors. They do not monetize visitors who leave and go to your site for free. Plus, if they go to YouTube, they'll find this guy. Never send your visitors to a website with that guy. It's just horrible for your conversion rates. You don't even remember what you were doing on the internet that day. You're, it's over. Just close your laptop. You're never going to, yeah. So careful. These, these, the laws of visual hierarchy are so powerful, you need to use them carefully. Use your powerfuls for good, never evil. Scroll, this is where I like, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm a big fan of social media. This is a good way to use social media icons. Put them at the very bottom so if someone wants to find them, they can find them. Gray them out until the person rolls over them. Right? Keep them together. So Ali has purposely mind control. He's using a Jedi mind trick, every trick in the book to get us to look at this thing. Right? But what does it say in that button that you read? I want Ali to speak at my event. What just happened? He changed the point of view. He changed the pronouns. You notice that? There's actually research around this. Just the calls to action are the only places on your website that should switch from second to first person language. That 90% increase in click-through rate. Start your free trial, start my free trial. The, the idea is to participate in that person's internal dialogue. So these little things can actually make a big difference. We use second person language throughout our websites, right? All web content, writing in general, right? Until you get to that call to action, which is when you're actually, the click is a metaphor for something they're doing in their life. So use first person for that. So, let's, so that's <laughs> a, lot of, a lot going on right at the top of the page. Which, By the way, he says some evidence there. Ali was the number one rated speaker at 75% of his speaking engagements. He's got some social proof right there at the top. But let's scroll down. Next, I mentioned the atomic bomb of marketing. He's got a video testimonial from an influencer right at the top of the page. When they're like a celebrity, that's more of an endorsement than a testimonial. Scroll down. He's got lots of other testimonials that he's harvested from social media. 
It's a great reason to use social media. You can embed these things on your site, and they are evidence. And then he's answering important questions, like what does Ali talk about? What, are his, what, what does he emphasize? What's his style? Scroll further down the page. He's got these other marketers on, on his site who are uh, providing testimonials. I think he'd get an even higher conversion rate if he made this one the first one. That Andy guy is so credible. You should just <laughs> move that one over. Actually, I'm using a trick here, and I, I have a sense why he put mine at the top, even though these other marketers are better known. Short paragraphs. See that? White space. Designers know to leave white space, write, but writers didn't get the memo. Write very short paragraphs when writing for digital. I try to never write a paragraph longer than three lines. It's just bad for your bounce rates, right? Don't hit your visitors with a wall of text. That's not how digital works. They're scanning, right? Short paragraphs, white space. And then you scroll down, and he's got actually a very long form down here, right? But the whole hypothesis, the whole thesis of un Unbounce is that the, the form should have like a, the attributes of a little page itself. It's got a box around it. It's got a headline. Do your forms have headlines? Very clever, right? He's got the call to action again. Contact Ali about my event. Then he answers one, yet one more question at the bottom. Ali will respond personally within 24 hours. Again, reducing uncertainty, increasing confidence, increasing motivation, reducing uncertainty. So Ali got a tall page here, 6,800 pixels. No tabs, right? no carousels. It's all on one page. 3,400 pixels of proof. That's half of the page. Maybe that's the game. Maybe that's what we should all be doing. Maybe our sites should just be filled with evidence. Maybe that's what works best. As I look around this room, actually, it's kind of filled with the audience themselves. This is kind of a fun example in, in a physical space. And yes, of course, those pages had, a lot, had something else in common. They're both really tall pages, which tons of studies show. I've never seen any research that showed that short pages perform better. If anyone ever sees that, that research, please share it with me. I'd love to cite that as a counterexample. I've just never seen it. It's just there's, uh, uh, there's no limit to the amount of space you can use. And if the visitor doesn't find the answer they're looking for, they're just going to keep going until they do. If they hit the bottom and they haven't, they'll hit the back button or leave or go somewhere else, which is when you left them uns unfulfilled. So the other thing about these designs is that they are, again, one column layout. We're controlling the eye. I don't know this company. It's a Windows company. I want to use it as an example of how web design has moved away from this approach. OK, you've got a form at the top. Really I, kind of optimistic, right? It's like, <laughs> buy her a drink first, dude. You just walk naked into the bar. That never works. Like, <laughs> that, that, that's not how the internet, I they, maybe that's their 10th visit. I don't know. It's like not that likely, that, unless it's a really transactional service. So you scroll down the page, and you get to now we've got a three-column layout. OK, I kind of get it. The visual prominence of the evidence and the proof, the third-party endorsements, the trust seals, is totally reversed in my mind. Why, would my, why make the color, in, the background is color, but the trust seals are black and white? Definitely flip that, you know, get a better result. But then we're not doing a great, okay, if the video is powerful or correlates with conversion, that should probably be higher on the page. A three column layout, a two column layout, a four column tabs. Where am I supposed to look here? That's the problem, right? Look at your pages and ask yourself, did you make one thing the most visually prominent thing at each scroll depth? I used to say, like, oh, one thing can, only one thing can be the most visually prominent thing on the page. Uh-uh. Only one thing can be the most visual prominent thing at each scroll depth. That's what's happening. That's what the eye is doing. They're moving down the page, and, and each scroll depth is a chance to control the eye. And this has been tested. Different things, competing columns, fighting, with the, you know, fighting for the eye. Straighten that out. They scroll down, and they get two columns of equal weight of, of, of similar topics, right? Similar topics. And the conversion rates are much higher, 30% increase in conversion rate. By the way, that's not a weird high number. But what would happen if your business just created 30% more demand? These are very common. Case studies often have 20%, 50%, 300% improvement in conversion rates. That is a, these are huge numbers. That like, well, you know, it's some of the lowest hanging fruit in businesses. Like, just what would 30% what would increase in demand mean? It's a lot. Also, we have to remove distractions. Here again, you know, there's, we really should make the page focused on one thing. This is why websites get old and rusty and need to be redesigned, is because people keep adding crap without taking something else away. General rule, don't add something new to your website at that scroll depth without removing something else. Have that discipline to not keep you know, polluting it or adding distractions. It's called the attention ratio. 
It's the number of things that the visitor can do versus the number of things you want them to do. Sometimes it's very high. Ask yourself, what, how many things can my audience click on on this page? Especially the closer they get to the conversion, this is when it becomes even more important. That's why now you're seeing people design shopping carts that don't have the main navigation. Right? Keep stripping it out to keep them focused on that path. You see crazy, this is not a joke slide. That's an actual email signup form. What are we trying to do with this scroll depth? What is this box intended to do? Obviously, you want them to, to sign up for a newsletter, right? And go visit some gluten-free cookies and vegan cookies and gluten-free vegan cookies and allergy, like what? <laughs> That's the opposite of good conversion. We should be totally focused on what that person really wants to do with this scroll depth. Speaking of email signup forms, I'm going to show you the best trick that I learned on this topic, and I will always teach this. That's my old email sign-up form. It just said the orbiter, which, by the way, who cares what the name of your newsletter is? I'm sorry. They just don't care. They want the information. It doesn't need to be branded. The orbiter. We like to share our thoughts about web strategy, usability, SEO, blah, 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 yawn, I'm bored. I'm not even going to finish reading that to you. That's way too many words. We change it to this. Join the X number of people who receive what? Web marketing tips. How often? Bi-weekly. It's a big red box. That gave us a 4,800% increase in email signups. That change. Actually, here's the specifics. That's the old version. It was at the top of the blog. Remember that site? This was our old site. Jill was on this site. The Wayback Machine will show you these guys on our web, on the old version. And this, was, and this is the version that had that 4,800% increase in conversion rates. During the X number of people who receive bi-weekly web marketing tips. So break it down. We're telling them what they get, how often other people do it, and we made it much more visually prominent through contrast and color. In other words, we added the three Ps. Prominence, promise, and proof. Prominence could be a pop-up window. I don't love pop-up windows as a user. I've never used one. I know they work. Whatever, however you want to do it. Prominence, or the, the promise, just tell them what they get. Tell them what they're going to get. What, give them what, what's in it for me. That's what every visitor is asking. What's in it for me? And proof that someone else does it. So when we put this on our page, there's where it appeared on the side. More recently, we've since redesigned it. Now we have what's called a sticky element. It's a sticky footer. It stays there no matter how far down you scroll. This is the bottom. Join the X number of people who receive bi-weekly web marketing tips. That's it. So if you have a giant list, this is very easy to say. There's millions of people who are on our list. If you don't have a giant list, and you have just one subscriber, it's probably your mom or your editor, <laughs> just get a quote from that person and put it down there at the bottom. Give some kind of proof, right? Like this is, you know, I love the tips you send me, blah, blah, blah. Like add a piece of evidence, right? Again, like the, the unbounced philosophy. Make it a tiny, include page elements in your conversion box. And I have a screenshot in here of the worst email signup form in history. <laughs> it has 22 fields. They are all required, and it wants to know how much money you make. <laughs> Before you'll, they'll, they won't send you their newsletter until you, ask, you tell them how much money you make. I actually met with them. They were panicked, and they wanted to do like this emergency content strategy session. And they flew people in from both coasts to sit in our conference room for a half day, and I couldn't resist. I'm like, so tell me about this form. Oh, yeah, yeah. We want to gather some data and do some analysis on our audience. Cool. How's that going? Zero <laughs> subscribers. Nobody subscribed. <laughs> and they're gone. They're, they're out. They no longer exist. It's a sad story. But, but if they wanted to know about their audience, right, they could have called Joel, like just ask, just call some people and say, what percent are you looking for help? What else did you try? Like you can imagine how much the insights they would have gotten with a couple of phone calls instead of this horrible thing. Okay, we're at the bottom now. We're at the bottom. We went from answers to evidence to um, questions, answers, evidence. Now we're at action. Calls to action. Specificity. Ali Gardner's first rule of call to actions is to have a bleep call to action. I bleep him out, but he likes to drop F-bombs in presentations. He says it gets him higher scores. I don't know. Maybe that works for somebody. Have a call to action. That's the main problem. Have a call to action. A lot of websites don't even have a call to action. Scroll to the bottom of your pages and ask yourself what you want the visitor to do. Scroll down there and ask yourself if it's not a dead end on the bottom of your sales pages. If, and in, by the way, contact is not a call to action. <laughs> That's a generic get in touch. Ver you know, there's not even a, it's not specific enough. It's not a verb. Michael Agard is a pro at this. Uh, he was at Unbounce until very recently. This Danish guy, another Danish guy. Create my account. Specificity. Create account and get started. Think that mattered? Yep. 31% increase in conversion rates. 
and to get started. Obviously, you're getting started. Like just but putting that there actually made a big difference. Then he tried this one. Get your membership to find your gym and get membership. 213% increase in, that's not a conversion, that's a click through to the next page in the process. But that makes perfect sense to me. Get your membership sounds like you're gonna spend money. But if the next step isn't about spending money, it's just about finding your gym, don't tell them they're gonna spend money until the very last step. This We just did this for the Goodman Theater in Chicago, giant famous theater, they're great. It was like the homepage had these plays and it said buy tickets. But when you clicked it, it just went to the play page. You didn't buy tickets, you, used the, you turned me off about the money thing, right, you know, by saying buy tickets. Then the play page had another button that said buy tickets. But that page just took you to the, the map of seats. So on the map of seats page, they said buy tickets. Wait, wait, wait. Like you, you're trying to guide them deeper into this process. You're trying to maximize the click-through rate from step to step to step. If the first button said view, you know, see the see the video preview of this play, and the second step said find, pick your seat, you can imagine how many more people would have completed through, right? And how their step drop report, also known as the funnel visualization report in analytics, would have been just beautiful, right? To see the, the flow of people through the process. So yeah, what are you doing? You're just finding your gym. Keep your wallet in your pocket. You're just finding your gym. Have you seen these fMRI scans where people, uh, the pain parts of the brain light up when people think about spending money? You can actually, it's that bad. Like, don't tell, they're not spending money until the very end if you've got a multi-step process. So specificity, that page you might have seen earlier. 41% increase. I, I know about this visitor. They're on the page about UX. What do they want? Conversions. So the call to action is about conversions. Increase my conversion rate. And again, first person language. So your call to action can actually affect this cost-benefit calculation happening in their mind. And that's how to think about it. All of your visitors and all of us on the internet are doing a split-second cost-benefit calculation in our brain before we click on anything. In every social stream, in every inbox, in every search results page, we're basically asking ourselves, is the cost of doing this you know, worth the effort or worth the benefit? Is this worth 0.2 seconds of my time? That's how cutthroat this sport is, right? You have to really get, tell people specifically what the benefit is or they won't invest even one second. So we're gonna make the return seem bigger or make the investment seem smaller. These are fake, but I made these in like a but online button creator. So don't just do this thing, do this valuable thing. Have you indicated any value or benefit in the call to action itself? Or do this easy thing. Have you told them how easy it is, how fast, when they're gonna get it? Don't just download the ebook, but download the ebook now and solve all of your problems today. That sounds great. <laughs> but I'm indicating some benefit. I'm playing with that formula in their mind, that cost benefit calculation. Or download the ebook when? Instantly. And start reading when? Now. Right? Sounds like it's going to be easier. I, I, I don't have to wait. Don't just contact, oh, don't just contact us. Get in touch and start improving your click through rates. That's why you would get in touch or talk to an expert. Don't, you're not spending money, you're just talking to an expert. Just talk to someone, or chat, or get in touch, or find a rep, you know, or speak to, a, speak, to a, speak to our event planning staff about having your event in the American Family Insurance Space at, here at Dream Bank, whatever it might be. So that specificity correlates with conversion. Specificity correlates with conversion. Another thing, and I don't have data for this, but there's Sarah McCabe's face right next to the call to action. This is another one that I want to test. I'm doing this for all kinds, all kinds of client websites. One of them we just saw, it was Road Less Traveled. 40% increase in conversions. They take like, they'll take your kids to Africa. That's kind of scary. But when you see Ashley's face next to that and ask us anything about the experience of our guides, way more people are clicking because as soon as we put Ashley's face next to that call to action. It's approachable. And actually it makes sense because it answers a question, right? Who will I talk to is a question. Sarah's right there, you know who you're gonna to talk to. Not surprising, we get leads like this. Hi Sarah, that's a lead. They're, they've already started talking to us in their mind because we're, we're more personal. So our job is to kind of, we're gonna wrap up in a minute. Our job is to find and fill the gaps, right? If your site is missing an answer, it's just unsatisfying and your conversion rates will be lower. Important questions are unanswered, they're less likely to convert. They're more likely to go look at someone else's site and see if they've got the answers over there, right? You know, can I bring my dog? Or how soon are you gonna come fix my pipes? Evidence, if you lack evidence, your site is just weak. It's just common, it's typical. It's like so many websites, you're just filling it with unsupported marketing claims. 
And finally, if you don't have any call to action, it's just not compelling. You're not giving them something to do. You're not encouraging. You know, so scroll down to the bottom of your pages and ask yourself, did you, tell, did you suggest that they get in touch? Did you use a, a verb indicating the, you know, what they're actually doing or what the benefit would be? So after having planned so many of these websites, I look at them now and I often think this. If I see an FAQ page, to me, that's just an important answer out of context. What is an FAQ but important information tucked away under a vague label, FAQ? FAQ doesn't actually say anything. It just says, you know, a lot of people asked us this stuff over here. <laughs> like, what? That should be in the flow where the question appeared in their mind. You did not create a hierarchy of messages that guided them through the, their thinking, right? And then I see these all the time. What's a testimonials page but important evidence out of context? Nobody clicks. They're, they're very unlikely to get read, actually, right? When I see testimonials pages on websites and I have the analytics account, it, it looks like this. Oh, great. You put that really compelling stuff you've got on your 31st most popular page. <laughs> People don't go to testimonials pages. It's so obviously going to be tons of good stuff. Right? That page just doesn't make sense to me. It's like serving a dish of all garnish. It's like, here's a bunch of parsley. You know, it's supportive. <laughs> it, goes it goes with everything else. Make every page a testimonials page. Fill your site with evidence. Blow that page up and put those all over. Put the best ones, especially through video, on your most popular pages. So the results of these actions are big. The ROI of these actions can be very big. This is the before and after on the last redesign for our website. And I have uh, separated out people who would just read the blog from other people. So now I'm looking at the non-blog readers. 43% increase in conversions before and after for our last redesign. It's a lot of demand. You create a lot more interest by just applying these. No other change. No other change in your marketing, in your structure, in your prices, whatever else you're doing. This is a way to get more people to make it through the bottom of the funnel. Or no, no, this is the conversion rate. I'm sorry, 26%. 26% for the leads. Uh, so this is, what, this is my goal, and this is what I love most when I go look at a client's website after it's live, is to see that they get leads every day. That's what, they, that's what it really should be doing. It's a mousetrap. It's a machine that generates demand. So to make it seem more real, this was kind of hard to do. There's a report in analytics called the real-time real -time analytics, which is almost more for testing. It's kind of like, is something broken? Is it tracking properly? It's not the most useful report. Can't really do analysis on it. But uh, I've, I used it here to try to show. There's a visitor on the web design page. And I recorded a This is me trying to make a, show a lead being born. They move from the web design page to the about page, which is what often happens when they want to feel trust or don't want to know what you believe in or who you are. I'm literally like leaving this on my screen and recording it, I'm trying to capture this moment. They move to contact, now they're on the contact page. And they're sitting on the contact page. I'm like a nature photographer. This is like, <laughs> I'm like behind the tree. I'm like, come on, they're on the contact page. Come on, what didn't I give you? Was there some question I didn't answer? What happened? Why not? Like, what do you, why are you just sitting there? I want to like chat with them. Like, took me so long. There they go. That was it. Now they're on the thank you page. That's it. A lead was born. That's the moment when demand was generated. And that's what a website is. It's a bridge from Google.com to your thank you page. Everything that happens in the middle, question, answer, evidence, action. That's the whole point. That's the job. That's the whole game is to move people to that page. And now that I've got a lead being born, I've got a good pretense to show little baby Ada. I've got a two-month-old, and uh, I'm getting her out there. I know. Look at her. She's so cute, right? <laughs> so that's my that's my new one, which is why I'm tired today. <laughs>